since Kent just got in the car and got in the driver's seat, Toaster thinks we're going <laughs> to take off somewhere and start driving and he really doesn't want to go. So he needs a little extra love. Can you, can you lay down now? Hey everyone, it's Natalie, also known as Nitty Natty. Welcome to episode 196, I had to check, of the Love and Stitches podcast. Today is Monday, September 4th. Happy Labor Day to all of my American and Canadian friends. Um, it has been a couple of weeks since I podcasted. I really felt like I needed a bit of a break. Well, there was a couple of reasons. One, we had two videos already ready to go for last week. And then two, I just felt like I was repeating myself a lot in the podcast with my projects. And I felt like I just needed that extra time to really get some new things going. So I have a finished object today. I have a couple of new projects going. So I am really excited to share a lot of that with you. Now I am coming to you today from Claremore, Oklahoma. Is that right? Claremore. Yes, it is near Tulsa where we're going to go to Knit Stars tomorrow. And we are at a campground. This is the, uh, it's a KOA, um, which is just like a network of campgrounds and it's called Will Rogers Down. So I don't know how much of it. There's like a horse track here behind me, somebody's trailer here. I'm trying like a new setup. I don't know if it's going to work. I tried to test it a little bit and see like where I can get good light. But the problem is, is there's actually too much good light. There's good light all around. And it's kind of hard for me to actually sit somewhere that I don't have light behind me. So we're still getting things figured out here. It, you know, it will take a while. We have a whole year to get this really perfected before I'm in a new location again. Um, but I think that's all I have at the top of things. I have a lot to talk about today. So if you don't already have a knitting or crochet project with you, something to drink while you're watching this, or if you're planning to pause halfway through, totally fine, because I anticipate this being a bit of a long episode. First things first, I have finished a pair of socks. I can't exactly remember where I was last week when I shared because I'm not 100% sure I moved my stitch markers. That's usually the way that I keep track of how much progress I've made from podcast to podcast is after I finish filming a podcast, I move all of my progress keepers down and then that way I know where I was the week before. What's the matter? <laughs> Toaster's right here, by the way. I know you can't really see him with this setup. So yeah, we may have to go back to the other setup. I may have to find something to kind of like put on these windows. That's kind of cute because we have shade covers. Anyway, back to the socks. So I do have a progress keeper right here on sock number one, which I finished the foot on. And then I have no progress keepers in sock number two, which kind of makes me think that I maybe finished this sock and completed this whole sock in the last two weeks, but I cannot remember. <laughs> I probably could go back maybe and look at some of my Instagram stories, but I figured it doesn't really matter. The socks are done and that is all I really have to show. So I'm not sure what I've done with my label for this one, but this is um, Freckled Whimsy and the color is called something like, it's a cute little phrase. It's all in my Ravelry project page, but I really like how these came out. So this is no particular pattern. I do have all the notes on my Ravelry project page, but I did make these for my mom. So I started at the cuff and I cast on 64 stitches and I did two by two rib all the way till about an inch before the heel. And then you can see on the back of the heel here, I switched over to stockinette and I also added some stitches. I think I added 10 stitches. Then I put in some waist yarn for the afterthought heel and moved on to the foot, uh, which I believe I worked 60 rounds in total. Then I did the toe. I did everything in this self-striping yarn. After that was all finished, I came back and I did my afterthought heel with waist yarn. So that means I picked up stitches and it was actually in between, how can I show this? It was in between these two orange. So this darker orange and this lighter orange was where I had waist yarn and all of this down was heel. And I like doing afterthought heels with self-striping yarn, unless I have a little mini to go with it, that's even better because then I'll just do my short row fish lips kiss heel while I'm knitting the sock. But if I don't have that option, if I don't have a mini to go with it, I like to do an afterthought heel. I just think it makes the stripes look really nice. They kind of do this bullseye sort of thing. 
and I think it looks really great. I've got a tutorial on how to do an afterthought heel with or without waist yarn on my YouTube channel. It's a skill I picked up from Susan B. Anderson in her smooth operator socks. Um, those are, that's a really good pattern if you're somebody who wants a pattern to look through. The reason I really like the afterthought heel, aside from it just looking more seamless, is I feel like it keeps the stripes as close as possible to the same thickness. You can definitely tell that this stripe is thinner, a little thicker, a little thicker, much thicker as the stitches, as the stitch count goes down. But I feel like it's not super noticeable. But when you stop in the middle of a sock and then you do a heel, which or there's a lot fewer stitches in a heel than there are in the entire sock. I feel like that breaks up the self-striping a little too much, too much for my liking. So I'm really pleased with these. I do need to wash them at some point. I did not bring any sock blockers with me here in the van because of the limited space. It didn't seem like something that was 100% necessary, but I do have wool wash with me. So maybe the next time that we're at a hotel or maybe when I have a couple of other things uh, to block, I will be blocking these. I'm planning to give these to my mom for either her birthday in October or for Christmas. So I'm not really in a rush to get these to her. Now, as far as leftover yarn goes, I do have a couple of different balls. I've put them into one of these yarn cozies. I'm missing one. I know it's somewhere here in the van. It's either in the passenger seat, like all the little pockets that are around the passenger seat, or in this tote bag that I have here that's I've just been throwing yarn into. But this is what I had left over, like the main ball of yarn that I was using. I like to rewind them. I just find it to be a lot tidier. So I actually have a scale right here in front of me. I was just curious how much yarn these socks used. So let's see. That is 31 grams, 31, how, why can I not say this, decimals, 31.82 grams, so about 32 grams, which means my socks used 68 grams. That's not exactly true because I have this little ball that I had to wind off, I believe from the first sock. So once I finished the first sock, I wanted to start the second sock in with the same stripe, which was the blue stripes. I wanted them to match but I ended down here with like this dark purple. So that meant that I had pink, I think just the two, uh, the light purple and the two pinks to roll off, which is what I did, cut the yarn, and then I could start the second sock with blue. Now somewhere my missing ball of yarn is a little bit bigger than this. It is the yarn that I had to wind off in order to start one of the heels. I can't remember which one because again, I wanted to pick something that would make it look kind of seamless. So I chose to start with this lighter purple color for my heel. I think it doesn't look too like out of the striping order on either the foot or on the leg. <laughs> my words are not coming to me today. So that's how I chose all of that. So I thought about making a pair of socks for my mother-in-law with these, but they would be kind of short. So I don't really know what I'm gonna do yet with this. I may post it to my membership and see if anybody wants to make a pair of shorty socks. I love the self-striping. I think it's really beautiful, but I have so many other yarns going that I'm not really feeling the need to keep this one around for me. So these may be going off to another place here very soon. And that will be that. Let's go ahead and get my tessellated pullover out of the way. <laughs> um, this is another one where I can't remember if I moved the stitch marker or not. If I did move the stitch marker, I have made pretty poor progress. Actually, I made pretty poor progress either way, although I'm not actually upset. I just um, have been making less, doing less knitting than I anticipated or than I, I guess would normally do before we started traveling about three weeks ago. Um, so I can't really be upset with myself for that because it's a totally different lifestyle change. And I can definitely see my knitting time is starting to increase now that we are getting into more of a routine and we're kind of slowing down a little bit as far as our filming schedule with yarn stores. I, there's a couple questions today about living in the van that I'm gonna be answering later if that's interesting to you. But anyway, this is the tessellated pullover by Andrea Mowry. I am planning to finish this and wear it at Rhinebeck this year. I really like how everything's coming out. There's not much new to say about this um, as far as like yarns and everything. You can find them on my Ravelry page. I did buy a kit, but I have a plan now <laughs> because I decided that I am going to do the 
Stephen West mystery shall knit along again this year, which just bear with me, it is related to this project. So something that I've learned about myself in the past year is that I really like a knitting challenge. I think it's really fun. I really like a schedule. I really enjoy pushing myself and I really do a lot better if I have kind of a single track or like a single thing to focus on. And so last year when I did the Stephen West mystery shawl knit along, I mostly had that project to focus on. I feel like there were some lingering things. Like I do remember needing to finish a Rhinebeck sweater or something with a little bit of overlap, I believe. Um, and so this year I would really just like that to not even be on the table, which means I want to finish this sweater before like hopefully a week before the West Knits MCAL starts. So I think the West Knits MCAL starts like the first full weekend of October, which is still the week before Rhinebeck. So my ultimate goal is to finish this by the end of September, giving me like one and a half weeks, I think, until the shawl starts. That will allow me to wrap up some other projects, whatever, or basically have a buffer when I inevitably need a few more days to finish this sweater. So this is the first episode in September. Oh my gosh, I'm like rocking the whole van as I'm gesturing. Um, but this is the first episode in September. And typically in the past, I have shared my project plans with all of you. And as, as far as project plans go, I haven't gotten them into my notebook or anything like that. But I have taken a little note in my phone and I wrote down a four week September plan for the sweater. Sometimes that's just the best that you can do. And that's okay. Eventually, I'll work myself back into the very organized Natalie, but this is this is a whole new Natalie, so that's okay. So my plan, actually, I guess I should get this back, is to work, break this into four weeks because there's four weeks in September-ish, and that's my goal to finish. So the first thing is to finish the body. I'm planning to add a little extra length to the body. I think the instructions say 10 inches for my size and I'm aiming for more like 12 inches. I kind of find that I like something that's a little bit cropped, but not super cropped. And I have a decently long torso. I'm five foot six, so I need a little extra length. I know Andrea Mowry is tall too, but something about her proportions, her um, body, uh, her sweater body lengths don't hit right on me like they do on her. So I find I need a little more length to just have it look proportional on me. So I don't know where I am now. I don't think I have a measuring tape. Do I have a measuring tape in here? I think I have an extra. Oh, I do. Oh, actually, look, I have one of these. It's not technically a measuring tape, but it's one of the twice sheared sheep uh, sock rulers from Sock Week. So let's just see. Oh, wait, that doesn't have. Oh, yes, it does. Has a ruler on the other side. So it looks like I've got, ooh, that scared me. Kent just came in here. It looks like I've got like nine inches here. You can go ahead and slam the door close. It's okay. Kent's doing laundry. All right, so it looks like I have nine inches, which is great. I thought I only had about eight inches. And if I'm aiming for 12, that means I just need to get through three inches this week. And I think I can do that. Now, ultimately, I would really like to put this on, try it on tubing give it a block. Maybe when I'm blocking those socks, I can throw this in here after and then um, let that kind of lengthen out and see how it's actually fitting on me. I need to do a little more, uh, <laughs> I need to do a little more research into the pattern and kind of see like, where does the underarm actually hang on the sweater because it's a drop shoulder. So I think it comes a little further down on the body than like something that's a little more fitted. So I might not even need that much length. Anyway, I need to look into all that and figure it out. That's for this week. Then next week, I have got a pretty big challenge because it's going to be a lot of knitting, but I want to go ahead and do the front and the back. So that gets us two weeks into September. Then in the third week of September, I want to do the first sleeve. Sleeves are can be a pain. But what I always find about sleeves, the worst thing about sleeves is that they're so much more knitting than you think they're going to be. So I try not to underestimate how long a sleeve is going to take. A full week is actually really pushing it for me for a long sleeve sleeve because that's a lot of knitting. But I think doing one sleeve the third week of September, second sleeve the third week of September, I mean the fourth week of September, and then I will be done. Maybe there's a collar or something in there. I guess I need to get a little more detailed as I get closer, but that's a pretty good like general plan, overview plan. So 
there's not really anything else to say about this sweater. Um, more progress hopefully to come. Maybe I will get my plan written into something pretty like a notebook or maybe it will just stay on my phone. Whatever is working right now is just gonna have to work. Since Kent just got in the car and got in the driver's seat, Toaster thinks we're gonna <laughs> take off somewhere and start driving and he really doesn't wanna go. So he needs a little extra love. Can you, can you lay down now? We're not going anywhere. We're staying here the whole rest of the night. Okay, let's talk about our next project. Okay, this one is a new one. I started a new pair of socks and I've actually finished the first one. Now, these are shorty socks, so it's not super impressive, but over the last couple of weeks, the way I've been able to, I guess, just get in some stitching time is doing simple things and doing portable things. This has been much easier to pick up while we're driving than my uh, tessellated, which I have to kind of you know, rearrange my yarns and figure out which row I'm on. And it's not super difficult. It's just, this is a whole lot easier. So sock knitting has gotten a lot of attention lately. So this yarn, do I have a label? Yes, here's my label. This is from Ruby and Rose's yarn. And it is a custom colorway that we did with Addie for the Love and Stitches membership. And we called this one, love and roses which i think is really fun to represent both of our brands and then she did a like a coordinating color and this one is called falling in love so there's like a dash for fall falling in love and we had a lot of fun picking out the colors we did a kind of a theme vote in the membership and then we did photo inspiration and we you know collaborated as a membership on that color and once we had our final photos voted on, we sent them off to Addie and she came up with this color. And then we did an event um, where I was actually there with her in Indiana and she dyed the colorway in front of us and we revealed it and it was really, really fun. Um, we actually have something kind of similar coming up in the next membership term um, where we're doing another custom colorway. I just think it's really fun to do and there's so many amazing dyers out there. So if that's something that's interesting to you, we're gonna open up the membership again in December. I just had somebody ask me that today. So for these socks, I have followed my own sort of midi sock pattern. It's, it's really a shorty sock, but it's a little bit longer. I like this length uh, in tennis shoes. They stick out a lot, so they're not like no show or anything by that means, or maybe even cool at all. But I really like how these fit. They don't slip down or anything. And it is a perfect fit uh, sock. So with my perfect fit formula with a fish slips kiss heel. So this one I also did from the top down. I did, uh, for me, I do 54 stitches to start. I did one by one, 20 rounds of one by one ribbing. Then I do my uh, perfect fit. I've got the notes on my project page. I do a fish slips kiss heel, which is a pattern by Patty Joy White that you can buy. And then I do something like around 60 something uh, rounds for the foot and then an ergonomic toe, which just means I decrease in a way to fit my toe shape. It's a little hard to tell here, but the decreases are not exactly the same. Um, this one is a left sock. So this side has a little bit more of a steeper slope, is that right? No, this one's steeper. This one goes, I don't know, they're different. <laughs> and it helps not have that extra fabric around the pinky toe. So that sock is all finished. I actually kitchenered that one this morning. And then I just right away started the second sock and I've already got about halfway into my ribbing. Um, Addie calls the this type of dye style her watercolor style, and it's really, really pretty. Uh, this is one that I had to wind up. <laughs> I guess I didn't have to, but I wound it up by hand in the car. Um, and I'm, I'm eventually going to have to either split it or cake it because I wanna use it for my blanket and I need to be able to hold the yarn double, which is not possible while it's in one ball like this. So I need to pick out a cute, oh, you know what? I might use, I just got this progress keeper out that my friend Nancy gave to me. It seems like a good one. It's like a little macaroon. It seems like a good one to go with this sock. So I might actually throw that in here so I can try to keep track of, <laughs> I'm gonna try to get back on uh, keeping track of my projects for the podcast. So let me just throw that into here. Yes, 
That looks very, very cute. I like that. And I have one more project to talk about. I'm so excited to talk about it. So I think we just need to get right to that one. And that is my blanket. Okay, that's a little better, I think. Sorry, we had to switch things around. The sun was coming down too fast and it was just blazing in and things were getting dark. I don't know. We literally, quite literally, pivoted the table. Okay, let's talk about this blanket. I have so much to share um, with you about this. So I'm trying to get myself straight here. <laughs> let's start with the name of the pattern. So the pattern that I am planning to use for this new blanket that I'm starting is called the Summer Fade Hexy by Mallory Crawl. She's also called Nautic Crawl. I don't know if I'm saying that exactly right, but I've been following her for a while. And then I saw this Hexy blanket and I just, I immediately saved the post as soon as they started talking about it. And this was long before I had decided I was going to make a blanket with yarns that I collecting that I'm collecting on my travels. So my plan or what I was looking for was a blanket that was crocheted because I want it to be uh, relatively fast. Like I want, so, okay, hold on. let me start from this part. <laughs> I want to collect yarns in every state. Sometimes I know I'm going to get more than one yarn in that state. And I want it to be a yarn that is locally dyed. Um, and if it can be a colorway that is special to the store, like it's an exclusive colorway to the store, or if it somehow represents the store, or somehow represents the region or the state, then even better. That's how I am picking out which yarns to get. So I wanted to make a blanket that I could use each of these different yarns and it would be very colorful, but also that I would be able to use them and make that piece pretty quickly. Like I wanted it to take a couple of hours or less because this needs to be something that I can have endurance with because it's going to be such a long-term project. I also wanted it to be something that I could join as I went. I don't want to have a whole, well, one, I don't want to have a whole bunch of things to assemble a year from now and then lose motivation. So that's part number one. Part number two is I want the blanket to actually represent the journey that we took. So I think it will be really cool that all of these pieces are going to be joined in order of the trip that we tra that we took, the, the path that we traveled, if you will. So that is what I was looking for. And I've made a lot of blankets this year already. I have done stripes. I have done squares. Um, I've even done multiple different kinds of squares. And I really liked how these hexagons looked. They have puff stitches. They have cluster stitches. Um, the pattern, by the way, is free on her vlog or her blog, but you can also purchase the PDF. I definitely recommend doing that. One, it supports the designer. Two, it's a lot easier to read without all of the other stuff in there. Um, but I think they kind of support each other because there's also videos on the blog or on the blog. I don't know why I keep saying blog. Um, so check out both of those things. But if you can afford it, of course, I think it's always nice to get a six. I think it was actually six dollars Canadian. So it was like four sixty for me here in the US on the day that I bought it. Um, so that's not for me, that's not too much um, to support a designer. So I started practicing because before I actually begin a blanket, I want to know a few things. I want to know how big is my blanket going to be. So this pattern is called the summer fade, summer fade hexi blanket. And the way that she did it is that she made a bunch of different colorful squares and then a bunch of neutral kind of white colored square or hexagons. And all of mine are going to be colorful. I don't want to have to get a whole nother bunch of yarn to join everything together. Um, I just want to do all of my colors. So I needed to sort of figure out how big this blanket is going to be. How many hexes wide do I want it? How many hexes long do I want it? And I figured that because I don't know exactly how many yarns I'm going to end up with in a year from now, I will make it planning on a certain amount. And if that, I will kind of over plan, like I will kind of plan to have more than I may have, because if I don't reach that, I can take in any of the colors that I've already used and complete the blanket. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to be joining this as I go. Anyway, 
I started practicing <laughs> and the first thing I did was I went down a hook size because usually I need to always go down a hook size because I'm kind of a loose crocheter. So I made this one and I'll be talking about all of these yarns later when I'm actually putting them into the project. I'll tell you what state they're from, what store they're from and all of that. And as you can see, there is an issue here. See how it is crinkling up like this. It doesn't quite look right. So I kind of thought mm, that didn't work out. Let me try again um, and go up a hook size. I also did not meet the gauge, which is four inches, I think, four inches across on the flat sides. So then last night, I finally had some time. That was last week. Last night, I finally had some time to try again, and I went up a hook size, and now I am meeting the size, um, the gauge requirement. So now I am four inches across, four and a half inches from here to here, and I'm not sure, I think that's big enough. I almost want it to be a little bit bigger. So I might play around with adding one additional round. The only thing is see how pretty those, uh, this color in this light is not really showing this off, but this all here, these puff stitches, these cluster stitches are so fun. And then we just get to regular double crochets at the last uh, round. I'm kind of wondering if I do another, if I do another round of double crochets, if it will look too flat on the edges. So I guess I just need to play with that and see, but I am happy with this for right now. These two yarns are actually new, so I'm gonna talk about them in the acquisitions section in just a second. And then I started a third one because I want to practice joining them together. So this one, I will work the first three rounds, and then as I work the fourth, it will be attached to the first hexi, which I definitely want to make sure I have that technique down before I officially start my blanket. So all of these yarns, none of these are going to be the first one. I actually was getting organized today and putting everything together into this huge bag. This is not all yarn for the blanket, but it is yarn that doesn't fit in my cubby overhead anymore. Um, but once I get everything sorted out for the blanket, I do plan to go back and start with my Tennessee yarn because that's the first state that we filmed in, though we technically weren't in our van when we did the Tennessee yarn crawl. I'm still kind of counting it as our first state. It's the first state that I got yarn in. So I will go from Tennessee yarns to Kentucky, to Indiana, to Illinois, to Missouri, and then to Oklahoma where we are now. And as soon as I get everything figured out, I'm going to be trying to zoom through these first uh, several hexes. I probably have up to like 10 at this time, I think. I also need to figure out, once I decide fully on the size, how much these things weigh. I actually just put my scale, hold on, it's right here. I can just, pretty much anything in this house, I can just get in an arm's reach. So let's just see. I'm curious as to how much yarn these hexes use. I knew they weren't going to use a lot, but I was kind of hoping they would use a little more um, than they have because I'm just going to have so much leftover yarn. And I have no problem, um, I guess I have a problem keeping the yarn because that's a lot of yarn to use. Maybe some of the colors I will keep. I have no problem giving away the yarn. It's just a lot more than I thought to manage. So let me see here. Let's weigh this guy. Oh, wow. Okay. So this only used 9.19 grams. So not even 10 grams out of a 100 gram skein. So that didn't use a lot. So I could definitely make more than one hexi if I needed to, which is again, totally fine. So I am just kind of letting it all process in my brain. I, again, I only just did these second two that worked out last night. Oh, one more thing. So this one that I did last night is much, much flatter. I mean, there's a little bit of wiggle here, but when you lay it down, I mean, it flattens out just fine. This one definitely was not fine. <laughs> it's definitely super curly. So what I realized, and I think, I think I can't really tell in the pattern if it's just, maybe it's just me and the way that I stitch, or maybe there is some kind of mistake in the pattern. But when I really looked into the photo for one of these rows, the third row, just in case anyone's making this, I noticed that it looked like maybe there weren't quite as many stitches in those clusters as 
the instruction set. And again, I'm not strong enough in crochet to know this for sure. Also, it's really hard to tell from a picture. And I'm looking at this one now that has, that I followed the instructions and this one that I changed it slightly. And it's really, honestly, I don't think you can tell by a photo. So maybe that's not it. But for whatever the case is, for me, following the pattern gives me curlies and reducing the cluster stitches by one stitch makes it a lot flatter. So that's fine. I found that that works. I'll make, an, I'll make a note on my Ravelry page that I made that change and that's how mine are going to work for me. So to summarize, I'm going to keep practicing. I'm going to attempt maybe adding another round to make these just a little bit bigger, use a little more yarn. I'm gonna practice assembling. And then once I have that all good and ready to go, I'm gonna go back in time to my very first yarn. It's in that bag somewhere. Start with Tennessee and then start officially making the blanket. It's been two weeks since I last showed you anything that I got and I've been to six yarn stores since then. So I have a few things to share with you. So I'm gonna go in order and we were last in Illinois. <laughs> and in Illinois, I went to Leading Men Fiber Arts. I actually do have some yarn from there but I can't quite show it to you yet. I'll be sharing a little sneak peek later on, but I did receive a gift from somebody while we were there. And these are from Prairie Bagworks. Let me see if I can get to, yeah, this is perfect. So these are from Prairie Bagworks and they are these incredible like rope sewn uh, yarn bowls. They're really lightweight, really flexible, and there's like a little loop if you wanna feed your yarn through there, or you can feed it through. I think this is really clever. You can feed it through. Oh, wait, hold on. There's instructions on here. And this has been a couple of weeks, so hold on, I'm trying to remember. So I think you put it in here like this. And then so that you don't have to go through this closed loop here and have your yarn trapped, you can use this other side where there's this little disc and all of them say something really cute. And you kind of, I think you lay it across the top and then you take the little disc and you feed it through this, like that. So then look, your yarn, especially if you have a ball of yarn, can be fed like so, but it's not trapped because you can just feed that disc back through like so and your yarn is free, which I think is super, super clever. So it was really sweet. She gifted me one of these ones. And then there is a longer one, which I think will be really good for having two balls of yarn together. So thank you so much for these. I cannot wait to use them. I've been holding on to them, keeping them nice and pristine to show here on the podcast. After that, we went to St. Louis and we went to Yarncom. What an amazing shop. It was so it was so cool because we came in on their knit night and they had three tables, three tables full of people. People were knitting, people were crocheting, people were having dinner, people were playing Cards Against Humanity, Knitting Edition. I mean, it was just such a fun time. And I believe Yarn Com is Yarn Community. And you could really tell that there was amazing community there. We filmed a reel, which will be coming up at some point. I will be doing that. Uh, but let's see, I got a bowl of yarn there because I got to meet the dyer. So this yarn, let's show the yarn first. I've been getting my yarn wound whenever I'm going places now. Um, I haven't actually found, I got to the bottom of my bag here. So these are my first three yarns from Tennessee and uh, Kentucky and Indiana. And I have not got those wound as you can see. So now I'm getting my yarns wound. So this one is super beautiful. My light is pretty warm in here, so it's not showing the color. It's a little bit lighter than this. And this is from Honey Girl Farms, who is Shauna. And Shauna was there. I got to meet her. I have a picture with Shauna and the yarn. So there we go. Honey Girl Farms. And this color I think is called Sassanac. I'm not really familiar with the name. It is an Outlander inspired color. So if you're an Outlander fan, uh, maybe you'll like that. Shauna said this was kind of the color way that 
um, made her and became really popular and kind of had her yarn sales take off. So I thought that was really cool to get that. Plus it's a nice, beautiful, sort of a neutral, which will, I think will look really cool in my blanket. And my parents are really into Outlander, so it made me feel in some way, I think, connected to them. <laughs> so I thought that was cool. I texted my mom and I was like, do you know what this means? And um, she did, but she also has never seen a yarn label before, which I guess I should have anticipated that. And she was like, I don't know what um, something sock means. And it was the name of the base. <laughs> I was like, it's okay, you don't need to know what that means. Okay, after that, we, oh wait, I have one more thing from Yarn, oh no, two more things from Yarn.com. So I have one of their little Notions kit kits, which is in one of these little metal tins, which I think is so cute. I believe that this sticker is either on top or it came in it or something, I'm not really sure. I might've just taken that out. Okay, so let's talk about what's in here. There is a wooden needle gauge. Actually, that might've been separate, I might have, I'm not sure if that comes in there or not, but I have one of them. There we go, Yarn Calm, wooden needle gauge. I like that it's nice and small. There's a bunch of fun looking stitch markers. I don't really know if I can show you because I can't really tilt and show you. Hold on, how about this? There we go. Super cool, super fun. A nice, really hot pink try it on tubing. And there's a bunch of other different stitch markers in here. There's like those plastic ones. There's also some uh, tapestry needles. Anyway, I just think that's really fun to kind of sell a little Notion starter kit for people because one, it could be your first set of Notions and you kind of have all the things you need right off the bat or for people who already have a lot of things at home, it could be a great way to have a portable one. So I really like that. Then I also have some more stitch markers. Now these are from Tangerine Designs, which is a local maker. They're in St. Louis. No, yes, St. Louis. Can't remember if I had said we're in St. Louis now. I don't think I did. And so these are like beachy themed ones. So they're little acrylic markers, little flip flops, little palm trees. Lots of really cute things in those. But what I really want to show you from this maker is this. This is so cool. So again, this is from Tangerine Designs. I got it at Yarncom. And it is a cake holder, like on the go cake holder. So let's open this thing up because I haven't yet. And I want to show you how it works. Okay, so it comes with two acrylic pieces. Let me get this out. Come here. And this was the second to last one in there because they have been selling. So of course I had to get pink. It has black sparkly stars. So it has two acrylic pieces. I believe you just put the smaller end in like that. Are we seeing where this is going now? And then this is some kind of like, I don't know what this technique is called. It's not crochet, some kind of braided thing, but it's a little clip. So I'll just clip that on. So there, I'm so bad at doing clips. This is why I need those giant earring back progress keeper things because I cannot do the regular lobster claws. <laughs> I don't know what is wrong with me. So anyway, now I'm all set up here, except I don't have a ball of yarn, but this can go on your wrist. And I think I've done a terrible job of showing you what this does. Hold on. I need a ball of yarn to actually show you how about, oh, not that one. How about, the one from Yarncom. So this needs to go through the center of the ball of yarn. Is that right? No, wait, I've done something wrong. We're figuring this out together. Put the bottom on, then, then? Yes, <laughs> I think we've finally gotten it. And now, I have to do that clip again. It's like all my fingers are in the way. There we go. Okay, look at that. It's a little cake holder and this swivels so it can swivel around. So how fun is this? It's nice and lightweight. If you're walking around, you can go like that. Or if you're somebody who, I don't know, like me likes to go to a bar and knit, I could hang this up on the little hook under the bar or you could hang it up on a bike or a treadmill and then you could just pull your yarn um, off the outside, actually, if you want to. 
I just thought that was super cool. So I had to get one of those. Okay, that I think is everything from Yarncom. So let's move on. After St. Louis, we went to Kansas City, but first we went to Lee's Summit, which is about 20 or so minutes, I think, outside of Kansas City. And we went to Unwind Fiber Arts. We did film a tour there, so that will be coming down the line. And I had to get some special yarn there. So I have a couple of yarns from Missouri because I couldn't resist. So this is not really a Missouri yarn. It kind of is, it kind of isn't. It is La Bien Ame. And Amy, who is the creator of La Bien Ame, um, used to live, from what I understand, used to live like somewhere in the area. I wasn't sure if it was Missouri or Kansas, but somewhere like kind of close by, but now is in Paris. Um, so, but it was still kind of cool. And this colorway is an exclusive colorway to unwind. So that's why I wanted to get it. So La Bien Ame, they actually had a lot of exclusive colors, but this one is called Midwestern Sunset. And I just thought that's perfect because it represents Missouri. And I think that was really fun. So again, I'm looking for local yarns, but I'm also looking for them you know, if they're special to the store, or if they represent the store, it's just too fun and I can't resist it. Okay, after that, <laughs> we were still in Kansas City and we went to Yarn Social. We filmed a reel there and I got this beautiful blue. This is from Coast to Coast. I've been wanting to try Coast to Coast yarns and I just happened to see them there. And this was an exclusive colorway to a uh, yarn social. I'm having to keep checking my notes because a lot of the yarn stores, let's see, three of the ones that I'm talking about in this segment all start with yarn, so I don't want to mix them up. So that's why I'm looking down at my notes a lot. Uh, this is a Kansas yarn. So even though yarn social is in the Missouri side of Kansas City, if you walk two blocks, like two short blocks down, you are in Kansas. So this is also local. So, but this counts as a Kansas yarn, kind of, and a Missouri yarn, but it is called Misty Morning. And in Kansas City, they are known as like the city of fountains. I don't know if that was the inspiration for the Misty Morning colorway, but I made it be so in my own mind and it felt right to get that for Kansas City. So that's another one going into the blanket. Where do I want to put this? Kind of want to keep that out because I'm going to work on that later. And then Finally, <laughs> we went to a yarn barn in Lawrence, Kansas and filmed a tour there. It was absolutely amazing. This is the biggest store we've been to so far. And they have a, they do a lot of online uh, sales. And so they have a really big storage space that they showed us. They also have been kind of acquiring the um, different rooms in the building as other tenants have left. So now they have a huge classroom and if you are a spinner or a weaver, they have so much stuff for you there, especially for weavers. They have a ton of looms, they have a ton of weaving yarn, um, and then they have a ton of yarn for knitting and crochet. And then of course you can mix and match too, but it was just really cool, uh, really um, different from a lot of the other stores we've been seeing. So I got this yarn, I guess I can show it to you in the <laughs> hexi and in the yarn. The color, man, I really have to get my lighting better because the colors are just not showing up well. I've been posting all of these as I've been getting them on my Instagram, and then I've been saving them in a highlight on Instagram. So if you want to see a more accurate color representation, if you haven't been already seen it on Instagram, you can find it there. This one is a Kansas dyer out of Wichita, and it is 316 Dye Studio. And I actually put up for a vote which color of theirs to get because there was one called Emerald City, and then there was this one, which is called Wheatberry. And so y'all picked Wheatberry. It won by quite a lot. I think it was like 60 something percent to 40 something percent that the Wheatberry one was the winner for the most kansas -y yarn. So I'm really, I was really excited to work with it, which is why I picked it last night uh, to test out another Hexi. Uh, let's see, there was one other. Kent has also been buying yarn here and there, not as much as me, but he's been buying stuff as prizes for the Love and Stitches membership. So he got this one from 316 Dye Studio. 
So let me start this over because Kent is making me cut out a part of it. Uh, I can't show the colorway name because for our Love and Stitches members, this is a prize and they are gonna have to guess this color, but this is from 316 Dye Studio. Okay, I have one more thing to show you. And this is something that I've been holding on to for a couple of weeks because I got a lot of goodies when I went to Ruby and Roses, but we were kind of saving it for a couple of weeks to announce a new promotion that we are doing. Um, so Addie and I are collaborating on um, well, I guess collaboration is not exactly the right word. It's more of they're launching an affiliate program and I am so excited to be one of their affiliates. So what that means is that I now have a, my own special link for Ruby and Rose's yarn. I love their yarn. I hope you got to watch the tour that we did there at the dye studio. Um, Addie and Devin are both such amazing people. It was so fun to go there and to film and to do our membership thing. So I'm just really excited to be a part of this affiliate program. And it's just really cool um, that they are doing something as a small business to support other small businesses. And then me sharing the link and sharing about their yarns helps them as a small business. It's just, you know, one of those rising tides, a lift all ships kind of thing. So if you use the affiliate link, you will be, um, it will not cost you any extra you will be helping me out and supporting my channel by using my affiliate link if you're already shopping with Ruby and Roses. And then if you're a new customer, you will actually get a little discount. You will save $5. So you can either use my link down below or you can put in my code Nitty Natty when you're shopping with them. I do think they still have some more advents. So maybe you want to save $5 on an advent, um, but I do have some lovely yarns that I picked out before we left there. If you are a Love & Stitches member, I have a few more of our special colorway that I'm going to be giving away, um, but those are for our members, so I'm not gonna linger on those. But I do have a few things that are from the new fall collection. And Addie, forgive me, because now I can't remember exactly which ones were which. I probably should have asked you before I started, but all of these are really beautiful, so I'm just gonna show them to you. So I think these first two are from the new fall collection. So these may or may not be out yet, so keep an eye on them. So this is a really beautiful sock set here. This is called Whispering Pines and Candle Wick. This is like a nice purpley color, and then this beautiful green with speckles. Oh, it's super, super pretty. And oh man, if you didn't know already, Addie's yarn smells really, really good, and it's because of the wool wash that they use. So the last step for, well, one of the last steps in the dyeing process, I guess, is washing the yarn, rinsing and washing it and getting all that extra dye off. And they rinse those really, really well. And they use a wool wash and it just, it really smells very, very good. It smells, I don't know how to describe it. It's not a clean laundry smell, but it is clean. If that makes sense. It's so good. This one, wild. So, so fun. Um, it's so bright. And again, you're gonna have to go and click on her product photos because they're gonna be really, really good color representation. This one's okay, but it's not quite showing it right because I just, we have tinted windows and it's, you know, it's a little crazy, but this one's called Equinox plus Nutmeg and a one of a kind. So this is the Equinox. This lovely like nutty brown is called Nutmeg. And then this really bright like corally pink, not quite coral, it's not super orange, but that's a one of a kind. It's really, really fun. Then this one, I can't remember what the story was behind this one, but it's really pretty. It's called Daybreak. It's just a lovely variegated. And Addie has 12 bases right now um, that are just awesome. She's got a page that describes all of the bases. So what I've been knitting with my socks is Soft Sock, which is this one. It's an 8515 Superwash Merino Nylon and a four ply. And then she's also got Plump Rose, which is also 8515, but a two ply, which I really like for shawls and garments and things. I mean, also for socks, but I really like it on that. And then one of her bases that I had to make sure that I tried is this Rose Bulky. And it is a 100% superwash merino. I think it's really nice to find hand dyed bulky yarns because you can't always find those. And this color it's called Sail Away. I think this was one of her new colorways as well. And then I got 
her Surrey base in a bright pink. How fun will those be together? Aren't they so cool? Um, this one is called Material Girl. And this is the Rose Cloud, which is a Surrey alpaca and mulberry silk base. So again, I am now an affiliate for Ruby and Roses. So anytime you shop for them, I would, or shop with them, I'd love it if you could support my channel and use my link, which will be down below. I'll put it in my Instagram as well. Um, I'm really excited for Addie and Devin as they continue to grow. If you don't know, they're a young, really young couple. And it's just amazing to see what they've already done in the yarn industry. I'm just so happy for them and really excited to be able to represent them. How fun. That's another one on Ro Rose Bulky. That's our custom colorway. I feel like I lost one in the process of this. Oh, here it is. This one, so pretty. Okay, I'll put the link down below, as well as um, I think I'm gonna try to link the stores that I bought the other ones from, but we will also have tours and reels of every, all the stores that we're going to. We're trying to represent as many small businesses as possible and share um, so many different uh, things with you so that you can see uh, spaces all across the country. Uh, it's just been really, really fun. All right, that was a really long <laughs> acquisition segment. Let's move on to our next thing. Somehow when I got up, Toaster has scooted way out. <laughs> I don't have anywhere to sit. That's okay, you can kind of see him now. <laughs> anyway, let's answer some questions. We've got some about van life this week, got some about Nick Companion, got some about a muscle girl hat. So let's just get right into it. I really had a hard time picking this week because there were more questions than usual because two weeks have gone by. So as always, if I don't answer your question, that's not because I'm just trying to like not answer your question. It's because there are so many to pick from. I'm trying to keep them buried from week to week. And if you really, really want an answer, just ask the question again the next week, or you can even send me an email. All right, question number one. This one is from MG, I can't, I don't know. I'm not even gonna try with the username thing. I wish YouTube hadn't switched to this username thing. It's so much easier when I can just see your name. Anyway, hi Natalie. I just started using Knit Companion. Is there a way to use Knit Companion to update Ravelry project pages while working on a project or are they separate? It was so easy to grab the pattern from Ravelry, but does the communication work in both directions? Thanks, Melissa. Okay, when I first read your question, I interpreted it one way. And when I just read it again, I interpreted it a different way. So I'm just gonna answer both. Hopefully one of those will answer your question. So the first way I thought of this was, um, maybe thinking that you were talking about when a designer goes in and updates the pattern. Maybe there's an error in the pattern or they have an addition to make or something like that. Um, does Knit Companion update that? So you know how you go into Ravelry sometimes or you get an email and it'll say, um, Andrea Mowry has updated the tessellated pullover pattern. And you go into Ravelry and in your library, there'll be a little button with like the little circular arrows and it will say updates. You update the pattern, you re-download it, and now you've got the new version of the pattern. So Knit Companion, as far as I know, does not sync in that way. The way that Knit Companion is working is it is pulling the current PDF from Ravelry. So if Ravelry, or if the designer updates their pattern on Ravelry, I think you'll still need to go through Ravelry to update it because they're just not the same thing. Knit Companion is its own thing, Ravelry is its own thing, but Knit Companion pulls PDFs. That's the way it works. It can connect with your um, library, but it's not gonna automatically sync things. Now, I don't think that you have to create an entirely new project in Knit Companion. I'm thinking you could create a secondary project where you have maybe that pattern page. And then if it's a whole bunch of stuff, I wonder if maybe you could like create a piece and transfer it between projects. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, but if it's something like a small error, I would just go into the pattern I'm already working with or the project I'm already working in, in Knit Companion and just manually like write that change in so that I don't have to lose all of my other notes. Now, the other way that I was reading this is maybe talking about your project page on Ravelry, like your personal project page where you're updating um, 
your yarn and your needles and all of that stuff. Uh, and the answer to that is no, Knit Companion and Ravelry don't talk to each other in that way. I guess I'm not 100% sure maybe what you were looking for them to do. Um, they're completely different programs run by completely different people, um, but it could be cool, I guess, if it would update like your progress, like the little progress bar, um, that could be pretty interesting. But as far as I know, it doesn't do that. So I hope one of those things answered your question. All right, question number two is going to be a two-parter because we got two similar questions here. And this is about yarn stores that we have been traveling to. Question one, do you have yarn stores picked out and planned for each state you'll be traveling to? Or are you more so out to discover as you go? If you do have them planned out, do you have any suggestions or know of any local yarn stores or dyers in Beaumont, Texas? I'm struggling to find a local store to support um, rather than big box stores. I absolutely adore your videos and you inspire uh, me so much to create. Oh, thank you so much. So this is the first question. I'll answer this one and then we'll add on to it with the other one. So the way that we're figuring out which yarn stores to go to is a really varied. We don't have them all planned out like for the next, how many we've been to, like six. We don't have the next 44 planned out yet. There are some states that we know where we want to go to or we have an inkling of where we want to go to more because there's something that is really special and unique that we want to go to there or because there is only one or two options. Um, thinking of like Hawaii, um, thinking of, I don't know, Montana specifically, we have like one place we really want to go to, even though there probably are multiple options. And we're also not totally limiting ourselves to one store per state. We're probably going to do one like big YouTube yarn store tour in each state. But then we're also realizing we can still visit other stores. We can, you know, patronize them, we can go and, and shop there, or I can make Instagram stories or reels and still support more stores in a state than just one. So something that kind of, um, another thing that kind of makes our decision on which ones we're going to is our pre-planned path that we have. So the path that we're taking is not from yarn store to yarn store, rather it's things that we want to do and see. So right now our path is Route 66 from Chicago to LA. We're definitely going off of our path and we already have for yarn stores, but going anywhere super out of the way from that path is eliminating some stores for us. Uh, what else is kind of making that decision? We're always trying to find things that are unique and different. Um, sometimes a store is just special because it is in a different place and it carries different yarns and the people make it special. But sometimes like they have something uh, super different, like the yarn barn that we just went to and they have this whole basement full of yarn, like that's super different and very unique. And they've been in business for 52 years. Um, we're going to Knit Stars tomorrow and they have 6,000 square feet of space. And they also have a really big online education program for knitting called Knit Stars. It's super awesome. So. There's always things that we're looking for, but we don't want to be just sharing the same exact things over and over again. So you'll see that we're trying to highlight um, local stuff there. As far as a place in Beaumont, Texas, I meant to look really quickly where Beaumont, Texas is. Um, you would think somebody from that lived in Texas for a long time would know, but Texas is a massive state. Let's see, where in the world is Beaumont? Oh, you're outside of Houston. Okay, I do not. I honestly haven't ventured down to Houston in a really long time. I'm sure there's some stores near there. The stores that I know of, unfortunately, are in Dallas, like San Antonio, Austin area, kind of around there, because I've done a lot of their yarn crawls. Um, so I'm not really familiar with that area. Um, I think you said you tried Googling. If you can't find anything, that might just mean that there isn't anything around you. That's the first thing I always start with too. Um, but here's the thing, even though there's not a physical store in your space, um, in your state or in your area, you can still support local stores online. I know there's a really great shop in between, I think it's in between Dallas and Houston. Um, Oh my gosh, I'm gonna blank on the name right now. I see them on Instagram every single day. I've been there. What are they called? 
Okay, I got it. It's in Montgomery, Texas. It is called The Modern Skein. It is in a really small town, but it's a fantastic yarn store. So you don't have to go to them in person to support local. And same with a lot of these stores that we're going to and traveling to. They have an online presence. You can still support them. You can still shop them, even if they're not in your physical space. Um, so I encourage you to do that as well. But I know you might be looking for um, community. So I found success in New York by using what is wrong with me? I can't think of any words today. What is that app called? <laughs> I've got to look on my phone. Um, meetup. I'm like, I can picture it in my head. Um, the meetup app, I found really a successful like place to find knitting groups and things like that. So there was a part two to this question, um, kind of a similar question, but with a few different uh, nuances to it. Uh, so here we go. I know you mentioned you usually buy something when you go to new yarn stores, but do you feel obligated to purchase more than you normally would when you are doing a yarn, uh, yarn store tour since you're making some money from the video? Also pertaining to your yarn store tour videos, I would love to hear more about the process of setting those up. How do you decide which stores you do them for? How often do the stores say no, etc.? Okay, so we talked about how we decide. It's kind of a multitude of different things. So the next step in the process, after we have found a store, I've, I'll do some research on them. Like I'll look and see, have they posted on Instagram recently? Um, or do they have a website? Like, can I kind of get a sense of what the store is about from those different social media platforms? That's usually a strong sign that there's going to be a lot of things to show in the store. Um, and then I will find an email for them and reach out to them via email. Sometimes I do, sometimes Kent does. We kind of have a template as our you know email to reach out to people. And then if we hear back from the store, which so far, um, except for, the places that we went to on the like on the yarn crawls, sometimes we don't hear back from everybody on those. But as far as the stores we go to and it's just that store, so far we have not gotten a no, I don't think. Um, everyone's been really great. Even if they have no clue who we are, <laughs> we send them some links to past videos that we've done. And as we continue to do more yarn store tours, I'll have more and more current videos to kind of show you know, shop owners like, hey, this is what we're here to do. We're here to show the best side of you. We're here to show everything that you have to offer. We're here to shine a positive light on you. We're here to share things, you know, um, in the community. Uh, sometimes in some of the yarn store tours, you'll see us go to like a local coffee shop or a local restaurant or something. Um, so we really want them to know that like, we're there to represent them well and to bring them more customers and to um, help them like kind of, share everything that they have so so far no knows <laughs> it could happen well i just we'll just have to see and we'll be we'll be ready for that um and i think the other part of that was uh do you feel like you should buy more yarn because you're making money from those so here's the truth we actually really don't make very much money from these if we factor in the uh the cost of travel, we actually probably lose money making those videos. So the biggest thing here is that we are trying to, one, one this is an incredible adventure for us. So the monetary gain from it is not the only thing that we're getting from it. I fully understand that. Um, but this is a business and we do need money in order to travel, in order to go to the yarn stores and keep this all up. So what we do to make money along the way as I have my Love & Stitches membership, um, which is something that is a really low co cost, really high value thing. We do so many different events in that. Um, I sell patterns still. That's one of my streams of revenue. Um, YouTube channel, um, YouTube videos with ads, they do not make a lot of money. Um, unfortunately, in the knitting world, they don't make a lot of money. When I was doing YouTube videos in another uh, field, those ads actually made a lot more money. Um, so the knitting ones, they don't do as much, but also now getting sponsored videos is a really big thing and that really helps a lot. So thank you um, for continuing to watch our videos that are sponsored, that helps us to continue traveling. And then doing things like um, affiliates, like with Ruby and Roses or with um, Yarnable or I don't know who else have I done affiliates with Amazon, you know, just different things like that um, helps actually support this journey. So 
Do I feel like I need to buy more yarn? I don't, um, hold on, Kent's coming in. So I don't really feel like I need to necessarily buy more things because we're there doing a job, if that makes sense. Um, but I do still want to buy things because I want to support local stores and I want to collect yarns for my blankets and for my travels. And so I guess I feel about the same as I do as a customer going in, as I do as somebody going in to film and represent the store. I feel pretty much the same about buying something. But I also want to say, I don't think that you should put pressure on yourself to have to buy something at every yarn store you go to, especially if you're traveling, especially if you're on a yarn crawl, if you walk in somewhere and you just don't see anything that's got you in the mood to buy yarn that day. I think you can say like, thank you and leave. I don't think that's a big deal at all. So please don't ever feel pressure to do that. If, there, if you're feeling pressure from somebody at the store, then I think that's actually a bad sign <laughs> about that store. And none of the stores we've been to have ever made me feel like I need to make a purchase. Okay, hopefully that answered all those questions about our yarn store tours. Please watch them. <laughs> um, I think they're really, really great. And we've got some cool and unique things coming up with those. Actually, this one, this Ruby and Roses one was one of our like kind of branching out there from the uh, traditional yarn store. All right, let's go on to our next question. This one is from Annette. Uh, what is it like to get ready in the morning? How have you found keeping a schedule? What has been the most surprising thing about your lifestyle change? Okay, so three questions. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your adventures. Okay, getting ready in the morning has definitely changed. My routine takes me a whole lot longer than it normally does because I have to gather everything up and go into a public restroom in order to get ready in the morning. I don't have to, I could get ready here in this space, but it's so much easier if I go into either a campground bathroom or a lot of times we've been staying um, boondocking at a gas station. So I'll go into the gas station bathroom loves cause they're really, really nice. Um, or the gym, sometimes I'm getting ready at Planet Fitness. It just depends on the day. So what I found after three weeks on the road that really works for me is I will lay out my clothes at night because they're very hard to get to once the bed is made. The bed takes up a huge amount of space. So my clothes are up here. So I'll get my clothes out at night when I'm getting my pajamas out. And that way they're just like ready. They're sitting in the front seat ready for me. In the morning, I usually get up and I use our little tiny sink here to brush my teeth and take my mouth guard out because then if I encounter somebody on my way into the pub public restroom, I am a little bit fresher. <laughs> I go ahead and put on my clothes so that I'm not in pajamas and then like I'm part of the way ready. And then I will gather up my things that I need, my towel, my like one of my bathroom kits, I have many, um, and go into the public restroom where I will wash my face, put in my contacts, use the restroom, and then I will come back to the van to do my makeup. So I just leave my makeup and stuff in here. I am a nighttime shower most of the time. So showering is a whole nother ordeal. I have a whole nother bag for that. It has, I have to take a lot of stuff in. I'm usually doing that either at a campground, like tonight I will shower at the campground that we're at um, or Planet Fitness. They've got really, really great restrooms. So it's it was something to get used to. It's not that bad. Um, I do that. And then after I'm finished getting ready, Kent's getting up by then. We have to like make up the whole bed, make it back into this little bench seat like you're seeing now. And then I usually make my coffee and breakfast and everything like that. So it probably takes me like two hours. <laughs> it takes a long time, hour and a half, two hours. Um, I don't know, maybe not quite that long. We're still figuring that out. I think your next question was routine or how have you found keeping a schedule? We really don't have a schedule yet. I think what we're finding is like little micro routines and little micro schedules like that morning thing. Like the morning thing we kind of have down. Um, getting the van set up for nighttime, we kind of have down. Getting the van set up when we come into a campground or go to a loves or whatever. We're getting those like mini routines and micro schedules down, but every day is so different. Sometimes we're we're always driving, but sometimes we're driving a lot. Sometimes we're making tons of stops. Sometimes we're um, like tomorrow, we're gonna be uh, getting up, going to film for a long time and then driving for several hours. So a uh, constant communication between me and Kent, um, talking about what our plans are, adapting and changing plans. And that actually brings me to the next thing that you asked. Uh, the last question, uh, what has been the most surprising thing? Honestly, I'm 
surprising myself the most, I would say, is that I guess what I'm most surprised about is that it has been an easier adaptation than I thought. I'm somebody who really, really likes routine and really, really likes comforts and really, really just wants to like veg at night. And we have not been able to do many of those things, but I feel like I'm doing a better job adapting than I thought that I would. Like I'm not going this first couple of weeks. I think you could tell I was really needing some more knitting time, <laughs> but now that I'm getting that back, like I'm doing a lot better. I think I feel like I'm, I'm staying up late and it's not being as hard as I thought. I'm trying to look at Kent and see what he thinks. I don't even know if he's listening. Oh, he's got, he's got headphones on. Um, maybe he doesn't think I'm as adapting as well as I feel like I'm adapting, but yeah, I feel like that's been the most surprising thing is that it's so different, but it hasn't been as difficult as I anticipated. So I'm kind of grateful for that. All right. Next question is from Sarah. What does your husband do uh, while you're at knit nights? Does he stay in the van and get work done or does he hang out with you all? I love hearing about your travels. So Kent is a very social person. So most of the time he wants to come in to knit nights, but he also knows he's like not a knitter. He's not part of like the knitting lingo. He's also not a woman. And a lot of times there's a lot of women at the knit nights, not always, but I don't know, it's a different, uh, the topic of conversation can be a little different. So sometimes he comes in, I would say most often he does come in and um, chit chat and hang out for a little while. And then usually he uh, comes back to the van or goes to do something on his own, goes to the gym, walks toaster, whatever, and does his own thing. I haven't been to any knit nights, I think since the week that we did the Indiana yarn crawl where we went to a bunch in a row. Um, or then we went to Illinois and we were kind of doing a meet and greet. So Kent was there to kind of assist and help and take photos and things like that. Um, so yeah, I would say most of the time he's either spending a little bit of time with us and doing his own thing or kind of, I don't even know if we've had enough time to work. We, we were really busy those weeks. I guess we'll see what happens coming up for any other future knit nights, but most likely if you are coming to something in knit night or meet and greet, you're going to see Kent, you're going to see Toaster, you're going to see us all. <laughs> all right, is this, I think this might be the last, oh no, wait, I've got two more questions. Figured I'd get in an extra one today since we have not been able to answer them for a couple of weeks. Okay, this one is from Caitlin. How long does the proven skincare last? I love the concept of it. Um, do you feel a significant difference, significant difference since using it? Okay, great question. Actually, I have that right here. I meant to pull these out. Um, okay, so you're probably not gonna like <laughs> this answer, but I think it varies for everyone how long they last, but I'm happy to tell you how long mine last. How about that? So I am somebody who washes my face every single day. This is my face wash at night and in the morning, and I usually do three pumps. And for me, this goes the fastest. Like I, I run out of my, moist, or my uh, face wash first, out of all three of the things. So that goes the fastest. So the good thing is you don't have to get all three every time. So uh, when I go, when my like thing pops up to renew, I will usually just get the face wash and the daytime moisturizer and skip the nighttime moisturizer. Uh, like do the nighttime moisturizer every other one. So my nighttime moisturizer lasts for me I would say two and a half months. One reason for that is I usually only use it three weeks out of the month because mine does have retinol in it and I get my uh, lip wax and my eyebrows wax. And to get wax, you have to stop using retinol a week before, or maybe it's retin. There's something in it that makes your skin sensitive. And if you get wax while you have it, then you can't, you will it's happened to me before, not specifically with Proven, but with another product I was using for acne. So to play it safe, I stopped using this for one week every single month. So that's why probably another reason why mine lasts a lot longer. And then the day moisturizer, I also use quite a bit of it because I put it all over my face and all over my neck. And so this probably lasts, I want to say more than a month, maybe a month and a half for me. So it goes probably, this probably lasts me one month, one and a half months, and then two and a half months is what I would say. Um, I did notice a difference pretty quick. I would say probably 
three weeks to a month in, I feel like with any kind of skincare, you always have to give it time because any immediate results you see, it's probably just because you're making a change. And then you have to like stick around with it for a long time to really see results. I feel like I'm still struggling with acne. That's just the truth. Um, I probably need to go to a dermatologist and get myself some actual acne medicine. This is not actual, you know, medication. It can help, of course, but I probably need to do that for my acne on my jawline. But as far as the rest of my skin goes, I really feel like I can see a difference in the just kind of the glowiness of it. Um, I wasn't using anything with retinol before, so that really helps a lot. So I, I like it. I think it's great. I also love that I can make changes to it really easily, that it is a subscription to save money, but then you can edit it in between. And I really like working with them as well. So um, they've been a sponsor before. They may be a sponsor again in the future. Um, and I think they're a really great company. And they're also uh, women owned, I believe. So that's another thing that I love supporting. Bless you, Kent. Okay, one more question. This one is the last one. And it is about the Musselboro hat. I haven't knit one of those in a while. Maybe I need to start one. <laughs> um, this is from Melissa. I was wanting to start a Musselboro hat for my dad and he is between size adult medium and large by about two centimeters. Would you knit the medium and block it out or play it safe and knit an adult large? Thanks so much. I am loving your adventures with Toaster and Kent and there are never enough alpacas. <laughs> That's funny, Kent's gonna like that one. Um, okay, so if you're in between two sizes for a hat, because hats have negative ease, I would probably err on the side of the smaller one. I knit Kent an adult medium when I'm making the Musselboro hat and it fits him great. And he his hat is pretty big, I would say. It's not um, really big, but it's also like, I would say on the bigger side of a man's head. Um, so I feel like if your dad is in between two sizes, you really don't want a slouchy hat unless that's what you're going for. If you're going for something a little looser and slouchier, I would go for the large, but if you're looking for a fitted hat, I think going down a size is the best way to play it. Now, the other thing about the Musselboro hat is that Isolde has you measure your gauge when you've done like an inch of knitting. I don't really find that to be super accurate uh, as far as what my gauge ends up being once I get to the body of the hat. So I would do some double checking on your gauge as you knit a little bit more. Luckily, after one inch, you still have quite a bit to go before you're done with the crown. And once you even get into the body, I mean, you can kind of see like my gauge, I feel like I can't remember if it went up or down, um, but it did change from like that first initial crown to the actual body of the hat. And that's where you want your gauge to be measured. So just keep an eye on things. If things do change, know that you might need to make a little bit of an adjustment and go back to your crown to either add or remove stitches. It's really easy to do. Um, but yeah, I think I would err on the side of going down a little smaller because hats have negative ease and you don't want it to be too big. All right, thank you all for your amazing questions. If you have any questions for me, you can put them down in the comment below. Just make sure to put hashtag question in front of it so I can make sure to look for it for next week. I think the sun has come down far enough that I can open back up this window. I've also switched sides since I had the window open, so maybe you haven't seen out here yet. You can see a little bit more of the horse track, which is kind of cool. And I'm going to try to finish up before the sun fully goes down. <laughs> All right, we have some news to talk about. I have had three videos come out since the last podcast um, because a video came out on podcast day that wasn't a podcast. So here are those last three videos. Um, first, we did the Pearl, Indiana yarn crawl. This is five local yarn stores in Indiana. Um, these are really cool. So it was totally different than the 13 stores that we did in Tennessee. I would say that three of them are like traditional yarn stores that you may have in mind when you think yarn store. One of them is in a, a home um, that used to be their, I think it was their parents' home. I believe that was right. So that one's really unique and they have sheep there and they uh lynn spins hand spins the yarn from the sheep which is really really cool and then the other one is an alpaca farm and a fiber mill which was super super cool that one's red hill so that was really fun 
And then um, not only that, a few of the stores even have uh, yarn store owners that hand dye yarn. So at the Clay Pearl, you'll see hand dyed yarn. At Rebel Pearl, you'll see hand dyed yarn from the owner. Um, it was just really cool. So each of those stores uh, was really unique, really awesome. We spent a lot of time at them uh, because we had a lot more time to spend at them. And also I got to sit and do knit nights at three of the stores, which was really awesome. So I hope you enjoy that video. Then uh, we did a video with Knit Companion. Uh, it was sort of a getting started on a new project, but mostly a tutorial episode. Oh my gosh, Chester is looking so loud. Um, anyway, um, I walk you through how to get a project set up on the Knit Companion app. And I want to say that something that I should have said at the beginning of that video is that Knit Companion and there is a free version of the app, but most of the features that I was showing are part of the paid for version. I think I said that the paid for version is $20, but I believe it's actually $25. Um, so there's a couple of things in there that I maybe needed to fix like in the beginning of that. Um, but anyway, $20 or $25, it's, it's just around there. It is so worth it. And that's a yearly, sorry, that's an annual um, subscription fee. And it is well, well worth it to get all your patterns in there. Um, you'll see a lot of the amazing features of Knit Companion in that tutorial, but I specifically focusing on cable charts because I still really want to start an all of the lights cardigan. I don't know when it's going to happen because I need to finish or I want to finish tessellated. And then I want to do the Stephen Weschel and then it'll basically be Christmas time and I'll be doing Advent. So I don't know, maybe it's a new year project um, and I can just get it all figured out before then. But I do show you how to set up a basic chart, how to um, specifically color code your cables and how to set up your charts with magic markers so that it will count stitches for you. It's super amazing. Hey, buddy. <laughs> and then the last thing, oh, now he gets to see outside. Pretty cool out there, huh? The last thing is that uh, the Ruby and Roses studio tour video is up. So Addie has a, uh, a beautiful, amazing studio that almost looks like a yarn store because she's got all her yarn hung up on walls and in shelves, but it is not open to the public. It is a studio. Um, and we got to go into the back and see the dye studio. I got to sit down and interview her. We just learned so much about the dye process there. It was super, super fun. So I hope you enjoy that one. Now coming up next week, we are going to be at Leading Men Fiber Arts in Clinton, Illinois on YouTube. We've already actually gone there and we are going to be getting a tour of their store and also getting to go back into their dye studio. Something fun we're going to do with them though is we are actually going to dye a very special Nitty Natty colorway. I got to have the input into it. I am really excited for it. I will be showing you, actually, we'll just show it to you right here. Here's a little sneak peek. This is not the finished color, although you can expect it to be quite colorful and have pink in it, of course, but it's got other colors as well. And we're gonna be selling those as a sock set. So I am really excited to show you the final product. And then just a couple other things that are coming up. DFW Fiber Fest is September 14th to the 17th in Dallas, Texas. Technically it's in the Irving Convention Center in Irving, but it's pretty much in Dallas. I will be there. I want to do some type of meetup either on Friday or Saturday. I tried to reach out to the coordinators to see if there was like a good spot to do meetups because I don't really know what works best there. At Rhinebeck, it's really easy to go like meet on the hill because it's an outdoor space and you're not really in anyone's way. Um, but in DFW Fiber Fest, I'm not sure if they're going to be set up like they did last year where there's a really big space in the middle. So maybe it will just be a really big space in the middle. Maybe it will just be like, say hi if you see me. I don't really know yet. We're definitely not meeting outside because it's going to be really hot. Um, but if you are going to Fiber Fest, I would love to. Uh, I would love it if you would say hi if you see me. And then the other thing is the Kansas City Yarn Crawl is also that weekend, September 14th through the 17th. It includes five stores, three of which we have been to, Yarncom and, no, not Yarncom, that was the one in St. Louis. See, this is what happens when I don't look at my notes because everything has yarn in it. <laughs> Unwind, uh, Yarn Social and Yarn Barn we've been to, and then there are two additional stores. So if you are in the Kansas City area, I would definitely recommend uh, checking that out. I am going
trying to do my best to tell you about these last two weeks and not underdo it. Like I want to do it justice, but to be honest, there are so many different cool little things that we have done that I am not going to be able to share just because of time and just because of my my memory. But uh, Kit and I have been filming our travel journeys, our journey, and we are still planning to do a second YouTube channel. It's going to probably be a little more uh, low maintenance, I think, than the Nitty Natty channel, which means it might not be quite as polished. Also, it might not be quite as timely. Uh, it definitely won't be quite as timely because we have Nitty Natty to do and it takes up most of our time and we want to do that well, um, but we do want to share our travel. So please just continue be, being patient with us and hopefully we'll be able to share all of our travels in so much more detail with those YouTube videos. So when I last talked to you, we had just left Chicago. I believe we stopped somewhere in between Chicago and Clinton, Illinois at Leading Men Fiber Arts to film the podcast. And kind of like this, the, the sun was setting and the, the time was, we were rushing for time and everything like that. Except today, my only time rush is that the sun is setting. Not really that big of a deal other than that. Um, but anyway, the sun is setting in case you can't tell. <laughs> so uh, after that, we did go to Leading Men Fiber Arts in Clinton, Illinois. I already talked a little bit about that, um, but I got in the dye studio with Steve and Andy, which was really awesome. Um, it was it was just so much fun being there. We had my first official meet and greet on the road that they set up. We had probably 30 people there. It was amazing. So we got to chat. I, everyone went around and introduced themselves. Um, I got to take pictures with everyone who wanted it, gave away stickers, people got to meet Toaster. It was just a really, really lovely time. Um, we have been on Route 66 pretty much since Chicago. Again, we've been branching off of it. And uh, we did stop in Illinois to take a picture in front of this really cool Route 66 sign, but we've been stopping at so many like little peculiar, fun places along the way. So Route 66 took us through Illinois and into Missouri. And our first stop was St. Louis. Um, in St. Louis, I got to um, meet my friend Stephanie and her friend Shannon that I got to know for a little bit of knitting and lunch, which was really, really lovely. Um, we also got to go and see the arch. It was really hot when we were in St. Louis like 102 to 104 degrees. So it was, we were kind of like trying to stay inside. So we went to the arch. Um, there was a college there that was doing some kind of orientation where they were all doing the thing where you go up in the arch, which I didn't know you could actually go up inside the arch. Um, and two college students had gone, not missing, but like they didn't make it back in time for their time slot. And so they gifted us those tickets and we got to go up in the arch for free. You can see the really cool view. Um, I also knitted in there. They're these really tiny pods. It almost felt like we were at Disney, especially because they walk you through many different rooms before you actually go up and you watch like a little presentation and then somebody talks to you about the rules. And it was very, it was funny, but it was worth it. It was very cool. Um, we also, uh, after St. Louis, we then went to Kansas City, um, where we got lots of barbecue. Uh, we also met up with Love and Stitches members, Aaron and Leslie, which is really fun. Oh, and Aaron made, I don't know if you can see this, these scrunchies. This pattern is called spruce and it has like an actual elastic in it, you know, hair tie elastic. And then it takes just a little bit of yarn. So I think that's a really fun way to use up leftovers. And then Leslie uh, does hand blown glass and has been making these lovely yarn bowls. This is a 50 gram one and it's just super beautiful. She said yarn bowl, or you can use it as a, a cup and drink out of it. So I thought that was really cool. I was excited to get those things from them. And then we made our way. So, so we were, St. Louis is on the Eastern side, like border of the state of Missouri. Missouri was a new state for me, by the way. So that was exciting. And then we, we did a lot of things in between too. Um, oh wait, I also forgot to put in here. I just realized this. We also went to Springfield, Missouri and got to meet up with another one of my members. And we had, um, cashew chicken there. Oh my gosh. I totally forgot to put that in there. I think somewhere I have a picture. I think it's on her phone though. So I don't know. I have to find that later. <laughs> um, but then 
we made it to Kansas City, which is on the western border of Missouri. And most of Kansas City is in Missouri. A little bit of it is in Kansas. So we kind of made our way through there. And then we continued. We like kind of did a, the little part of Route 66 that's in Kansas. And then basically made our way straight to uh, Lawrence, Kansas, where the yarn barn is. And we did our yarn barn tour, but also uh, Kent started going to college football games. So he went to college football officially started this past weekend. He went to a game on Thursday, a game on Friday, and then together uh, we went to a game on Saturday. Um, and that was also in Kansas, I think. I don't know. I'm getting a little, I think Lawrence is actually where we went to the game together on Saturday. <laughs> I'm getting a little turned around with all the things that we've done. Um, but we did our first, no, where were we actually? Yeah, oh, that's right. So Lawrence, what, what day were we in Lawrence? Friday. University of Kansas, Friday. Lawrence, Kansas okay. Kent's correcting me as he's listening to this. So Kent went to the University of Kansas and Lawrence on Friday. And then on Saturday we drove to, actually we drove to Topeka, Kansas, dropped Toaster off at a Rover. Um, and then we went to Manhattan, Kansas, and that's where we went to the K-State football game. It was extremely hot. It was over 100 degrees. <laughs> and of course, we had seats where we had the sun until the very end. Um, but it was still really fun. And I got to knit a little at the game, which was great. So after that, we picked uh, Toaster up at his rover. He did an awesome job getting dropped off at a stranger's house. He did really, really great. Um, and then we have made our way into Oklahoma, where we are today. Uh, we did that drive yesterday was about a four hour drive from, I think to, we were in Topeka to wake up and Topeka, Kansas. And then now we have made our way to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Phew, a couple other things <laughs> that I wanted to mention just because they're super random. Um, one, it, we're not in the Midwest anymore. Oklahoma is considered the South according to the US Census Bureau. But when we were in the Midwest, um, I have discovered a newfound love for something called concretes, and they are, what's the right word for them? Frozen custard. So this prompted me to learn the difference between ice cream and custard, which then prompted a lot of discussion on Instagram about how some ice cream is actually custard. It was very interesting. But the basis is that ice cream has like milk, cream, and sugar, and custard has milk, cream, sugar, plus eggs. Um, although when you really get into like the nuances of it, there are some ice creams that have eggs. Anyway, if you have an egg allergy, you probably know that because you have to really look at ingredients of everything, but custard, um, somebody, somebody told me that eggs prevent the ice crystals from forming, which makes custard extra creamy, which is what I think I like about custard. And then frozen custard is also called concretes. I don't know. You can all correct me if this is not the experience you have in your state, but that's what we've been seeing at all the places we've gone to. And it's like an extra, extra th thick, extra creamy milkshake, and you can get any kind of toppings put in there. It's been really good. So we've been to um, Ted Drew's in St. Louis, which is a Route 66 stop and something that's really well known. Uh, we went to some place called the 66 Creamery. It was really good. Um, we've been to Andy's and Freddy's, which are both chains. Freddy's is a huge chain. It's in like 35 states or something. Um, but it's something that I found that I really, really like. <laughs> so I've been eating a lot of frozen custard. And then also everyone, I hope will be pleased to know that Toaster has been doing so much better in the car the last couple of weeks. He really hates riding in the car. Um, we knew that starting out, but we, when we do long road trips, we were giving him um, like a vet uh, prescribed medication to help keep him calm, which worked great. But like, we can't give our dog stuff every single day. So we were just hoping that with time he would get more used to it. And we're three weeks in and he's getting a lot more used to it. He is very rarely now um, panting or shaking or anything like that. And he's also just yesterday started laying all the way down and like actually sleeping while we're driving, which is just such a big relief. Honestly, that's one of the reasons why I wasn't getting a lot of knitting done is because I was just constantly trying to comfort Toaster move him around in different positions because he would be standing and bracing himself and doing all this stuff. So now that he's finally relaxing, it's like I can actually relax and knit, um, which is great <laughs> because we spend a lot of time in the car. It's nice to be uh, nice to actually get to knit when I'm in the passenger 
seat. Okay, so if you wanna see every single thing we're doing day to day, I share a lot of stuff in Instagram stories. If you're not already on Instagram, or if you are on Instagram, just make sure you're watching our stories because I try to share all the little bits of life that are easy to share day to day, but sometimes they're harder to share once I get to this weekly or sometimes bi-weekly um, podcast. So definitely go there. All right, I have finally finished Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zevin. I might have finished it. I don't remember. I would say it was a good book, but I don't know if I would recommend it. Um, it was a little bit, I don't know, by the end, it just kind of got like, I was ready for it to end, if that makes sense. I then, I'm reaching for it now because I want to get the author right. I then started another book, one of my book of the month. Hold on. It's in here. I'm going to get it out. Uh, I started this one, Shark Heart, A Love Story by... Emily Havoc. I got about 60 pages in and I decided to stop reading it for now. I might go back to it. Um, mostly because after reading Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, I really wanted something a little more lighthearted. And this book, while a completely different story than Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, it had kind of similar patterns where it was like, there's a sadness to it. There's a serious to it, seriousness to it. It's like a, more, a little more real life and maybe it changes. It does say it's a love story, but that doesn't mean it's like happy-go-lucky. And I just needed something light. <laughs> so I stopped reading that and didn't let myself feel guilty about it. I, can, I tend to do that. And I picked up and said Book Lovers by Emily Henry. I think that's who it's by. I just did that off the top of my head. Yes, Emily Henry. I want to say this is maybe my first Emily Henry book. I'm not sure if I've read um, one by her before. Really liking it. It's exactly what I needed right now. Just something easy and light to read. I'm liking the characters. I'm liking the story. It's just a, a lighthearted romance. Um, not really steamy. Maybe it does get later a little more steamy, but um, it's good so far. And it's just perfect for what I need right now. And then we really haven't been watching anything. There's been no time. Like by basically from the time we get up and go uh, in the morning to the time we're actually going to bed, um, we are on the move and we are not really sitting anywhere. We're not really doing anything. If I'm if I'm getting some time to relax, it's while I'm <laughs> in the passenger seat or while I'm in a yarn store or while I'm, I don't know, sitting somewhere doing something walking around a museum um like we did at the arch i was knitting at the arch um so yeah i haven't really been watching much except last night we did have some time to start the new netflix series one piece kent really likes the one piece anime i think yeah anime and so we're watching the live action um, which we thought was a movie but it's actually a like eight part series. So we started watching that on Netflix. And I have to say, Kent's probably liking it a little more than me, but it is pretty good. So uh, that's our new show right now. My tip of the week for you this week is about Knit Companion. So I already talked about how I did a whole tutorial about magic markers and stuff, but there's one thing that I didn't get to include in there that I think is pretty cool. And somebody pointed it out to me in a comment and I forgot about it. And I think I have it in one of my older Knit Companion tutorial videos, but because we're talking about charts, I think it's important that you know about voice activation. When you're knitting along and working on a chart, you're holding multiple yarns if it's color work, you don't wanna stop and even have to tap a screen. And with Knit Companion, you can do that. It's really cool. Um, I don't know, this is definitely part of the paid version, but I don't know if this is if this is exclusive to Apple devices because that's all I have, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, but on the Knit Companion website, it has a list of features for all of the different devices, Android, Apple, and also Amazon. I think you can also do it on your computer, so definitely check there. Okay, so go with me here. Let's see, camera, can you look? Okay, so I'm in the chart, I'm in Knit. See that little microphone button right there? I'm just gonna tap it. Okay, and it tells me my voice commands that I can do. And now that it's read, it's listening to me. So watch this. Next. <gasps> See, it just went to the next row. Okay, 
oh, heard me say next. But say that I made a mistake and I want to go. <laughs> if I say it, it will do it. Okay, ready? Back. Oh, now it's not listening to me. Back. Next. I think that's so cool. <laughs> I mean, obviously, if you're like out in public, that's probably not a feature that you're going to use. Um, by the way, you can just tap on that microphone again uh, to turn it off so it's not listening to you. But I think that is really nice if you're at home <laughs> and you're working on your charts and it just helps you, you know, keep with your flow, especially on a, a shorter repeat. It's just another really fun and cool feature that Nick Companion has. All right, everyone. Thanks for sticking with me through this extra long podcast and the changing light and everything like that. Um, I really enjoyed talking to you this episode. I do plan to be back next week and weekly here on out. I hope not to have to make too many two week long skips while we're traveling. That's just too long. Too much happens in two weeks for me, uh, for us to do that too often. So uh, we have lots of fun videos coming up that I can't wait to share. Anyway, I'm just rambling now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.